What happened to all the people today? <laughs> Sleeping, maybe? Okay, I'm just gonna turn on that so I can see messages from Kreftio if they show up. Yes, I got the message in Telegram. Okay, good morning everyone. And uh, welcome to my, well actually it's the fourth lecture, right? Sorry, it's not an honoring. Uh, so welcome to this lecture on uh, quality attributes, first lecture out of four. And uh, today, um, I will cover availability as one of the metrics. I will go through a little bit how to think about metrics and how to relate to them and uh, what questions to ask when it comes to designing architecture from like a specific metrics. Uh, and the following lectures, I will go through different uh, a few of these quality attributes um, as similar to, to availability that I'm going to go through today. So first off in this lecture, um, I'm going to talk about architecture and the requirements, how they relate, functionality, um, what considerations to make, um, how to specify uh, requirements, uh, quality attributes uh, requirements. Uh, we're going to go through something called tactics. Um, so these are the terminologies used by the book that I've been using, the software architecture in practice. Um, I can, you could call them architectural design pattern or, uh, or quality attributes design patterns if you want to. In the book, they, they're called uh, tactics. Uh, so I kind of like that term. But basically, uh, well, I'll go through that later on. Um, and then some uh, design decisions. Uh, and finally, a summary. So uh, uh, let's go through them one on one and I'll come to those other things. So basically, when we do their whole requirements engineering, like you did in the workshop and like uh, you've done in the previous course and everything like that, uh, we capture the functional requirements, we capture a non functional requirements. And a lot of the non functional requirements, like it should be user friendly. Uh, it's not a good requirement, but but that is a quality attribute. So that is a quality attribute con uh, requirement. And then we have a number of constraints that we have to stick to in order to produce the software. In terms of functionality, I find uh, functionality has a rather strange relationship to the quality attributes in the sense that you can develop software in so many different ways, right? So if you want to make something user-friendly, there are a number of different guidelines, of course, how to make something user-friendly. But you may pick, choose and pick between those. You may focus on something. When it comes to scalability, there are a number of different approaches to scalability. You may, of course, just add more resources to make it more like scalable up to a certain point, right? Or you may optimize your uh, architecture or uh, optimize the, you know, whatever resources to constrain one where, where you have a, a bottleneck, you may try to optimize that part, right? You may even like limit the number of accesses, like only one connection per user or whatever. I mean, you could in many different ways help your software be scalable, right? So um, function and architecture, they have a very loose relationship in that sense. You can realize it in many different ways. And uh, do we have a feedback? Okay. Uh, so if I say, um, like, if I press the green button, uh, the option dialog should appear. We also have different ways of realizing this, and it's going to look very different depending on what quality attributes I'm focusing on, right? So if my main focus is performance, like. If I press this button, it's very, very important that I get the feedback to the user very, very quickly. I cannot tolerate like this spinning wheel or, or this, uh, uh, what is it called, the time, well, time piece anyways. Um, I, I will not tolerate that. I want it to show up right away. So it's very good feedback when I'm pressing things. Uh, that will, of course, have some consequences when I design the software and the architecture. I will start looking at optimizing. If, if there are a lot of, okay, now it's a, a dialogue 
of some sort. So maybe that dialogue actually has to collect a lot of data from lots of different sources. So I might want to try and optimize um, the like data collection or the algorithms being used in the background. Or uh, I may uh, look at this uh, quality or um, QoS, right? Quality of service to make sure that the person who's currently using the system has priority over other users because they just press the green button. And the green button is of super importance, right? So if there's bandwidth limitation or if there's uh, CPU limitations, I might want to give priority to this particular user because the green button is so important. So there are, of course, when you think about that, like how do you design software around that kind of requirement? Like you start having to think about, okay, so this, this whole module here has to have a priority queue. It has to have a quality of service uh, measurements and stuff like that, right? So uh, it certainly has an effect on your entire software. But if, if instead the availability is the key issue here, like it must never ever break. If I press the green button, I, I may wait for a while, that's okay. But it has to work. I have to get this dialogue. Then you may want to have like backups and you might want to have uh, some form of check to make sure that the dialogue actually appeared. Uh, and if not, try again or whatever. You know, there are a lot of, of, of safeguards and, and checks and monitorings and stuff like that. You can go on here. So someone has to implement that, right? Someone has to go in and, and make the code for this check, for this monitoring device or for this backup to have a separate system that can run in case this one breaks down or whatever, right? Finally one, the, the if usability is the main issue. Then none of those other things, well, maybe they're also important, but maybe they're not the key importance. So maybe we just focus on make the button very large or user-friendly or, or place it in the right place, right? So all these very simple cases for the same press the green button, the dialogue appears, will have significant consequences in the complexity of the architecture, what kind of components and modules you need to implement, and all those things, right? So that is how we, we it's very important in the quality, when you do requirements engineering that you capture like what is important in this software. What does the customer want? What is their priority? And in the workshop you just had, uh, you did some, some design and based on the scenario or based on a, on a use case that the customer explained. And the next time in the next workshop, you'll be asked to look at like what quality attributes did the customer actually you know, present to you and, and you will actually have a session where you can ask them and stuff like that, what is important to them. Because that will also change how you design your architecture. Uh, other things that take to take into consideration, um, as I've said in, in the previous course and in many other case, situations, is that it's very difficult to test, make it user friendly, or make it modifiable, or make it, you know, scalable. I mean, how do you, like, as a requirement, when are you done making it scalable? I've mentioned this several times, so I'll not go, through, go into too much depth. But you have to like find the metrics. So that is also part of the consideration. How do you measure when you're done? And of course, like any other terminology or, or definition of things, there's going to be different opinions on things. So um, if we have a system that suffers a denial of service attack, is that part of security? Is it part of availability? Is it part of performance bottlenecks happening somewhere? Like where? Do we classify that? It's not super important, really. But if you look at the tactics we're going to go through later, like the safeguards you can take against this kind of thing, there are some recommendations and kind of design patterns on how to approach this. So finding the right one to use may be important in this case. But I mean, it doesn't, I mean, as an architect, you don't really need to label things, right? Just be aware that this kind of denial of service attack can fall into several different categories. But even so, people debate and stuff like that. But if you have scenarios, if you have a driving scenario in your application, it may help guide you if you want to pick one or other, or if you want to label it somehow. Uh, of course, they also use their own vocabulary. Um, 
Microsoft has a rather comprehensive list of a number of quality attributes, and I've noticed some of them using a different name from what I'm presenting here, um, but they are essentially the same. It really doesn't matter that much, but, but I'm sure that the company that you're going to work in the future, they might have their own vocabulary for, like, let's make it whatever, and then it means like, modifiable or, or scalable or whatever. Or maybe they mix or put several of these together. It's it's not super important. So, in this these four lectures, uh, don't pay too much attention to the names of things. Just be aware of um, what they're trying to teach you in terms of what you can do about certain problems, um, how you can go about thinking about these uh, attributes or inequalities, um, steps you can take, and so on. Considerations you make. So really these four lectures are to help you find a way to approach a problem, to approach a specific uh, request in terms of quality and how to think about it, what, what questions you should ask, uh, what questions you should ask the, the customer and what questions you should ask of your architecture when you design it. Because you can make your own quality attributes, of course, and I've had, I've had several uh, master thesis works that spoken on sustainability as a quality attribute. Of course, that's quite difficult because they, again, uh, what do you do to actually make something sustainable? Well, uh, make it modifiable because then you spend less resources modifying things and then you make it reusable because you spend less time develop, redeveloping new components. And so all these things fall into other quality attributes. So uh, defining a sustainability metric, you add a few things and then you combine a lot of things. But anyways, it's very interesting to, that you can look into your own problem, set of problems, and you, your company in the future may have a very specific problem that you're addressing that you may want to design, or design a, an attribute around. The benefit of actually doing that work, of, of creating your own quality attribute, is that you can actually spend, like, set up a few workshops with colleagues. You can uh, spend time deciding what will be our approach to solve these problems that are so common in our company or for our product? And you can create these design plans. You can give them to the developers so you can have a consistent solution for the same problem so you don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time, right? So, yeah, it's a way to focus your effort a bit. And if you're in academia, it's a way to get, your, get, get yourself published as well. So. <laughs> So uh, um, what I'll be looking at first is the whole, like, the steps, the, the, the questions you ask when it comes to um, the problems in these quality attributes, what they are addressing. So first, uh, source of stimulus. Um, basically, some entity like who or what actually triggers an event of some sort that you need to react to. We have a stimulus, which is what is the actual event, what's happening. So in, in the case of uh, availability then, uh, someone digs off the cable, so the stimulus here is a digger or a human or someone, else, or, or the, the source of stimulus, I mean, um, which causes the system to crash. So the stimulus here is a crash of some sort. Now, this is a very simple case, but uh, the environment, well, it would be probably the network module because it will be um, the network connectivity. Um, the artifact uh, may be a specific, like in this particular case, it's the cable in this case. Uh, the response, well, we'll have to send a repair team, but can we do something else while we don't have connectivity? Can we have some backup somewhere? Can we do some forwarding? Can we do some logging? Uh, can we do a, a splash screen to the users that says, currently the service is unavailable, but you can go to our degraded service over here that will provide you the basic information about what you need and stuff like that. Uh, how do we measure? Well, how long time does it actually take to fix this problem? Uh, can we give an estimation? What, how is the notification chain going? Like, um, how long does it take to actually get a repair person to get the work started? 
um, and so on. So a number of different things like this. So basically, who or what is responsible for the event? It's the source. What is the event? That's the stimulus. Where does the event take place? That's the environment. What components are affected by the event? That's the artifact or artifacts. How do we react to the event? That's the response. That could be logging or measurements or, or um, notifications and stuff to take. And uh, how, how do we actually measure where we addressed this event or this problem, uh, the response measure? Um, when are we done making something scalable? When are we done making something user friendly? So now we come to tactics. As I said, they're kind of like design patterns, so some techniques. So we, I'm going to show you later on in this lecture uh, for the availability ones, and then we're going to have a short discussion about like where you get to think about some tactics that you think might be relevant, and then we'll discuss that. Um, So why do we use tactics? Well, why do we use design patterns? It's something that people have tried, it's tested, it's a known way to do things. It's a way to recognize in your code a certain solution. I mentioned when we looked at CDO uh, that, I re that I recognized the command pattern, right? Same thing would go here. Like if I can recognize a certain tactics or way of handling, like this is the um, denial of attack security module or whatever, you know, there, there are some ways I could recognize certain code and I can figure out, and hey, that's that. You can, you know, not copy paste uh, as easily as for a, a design pattern maybe, but you could create the same kind of structure or, or way of dealing with problems. Um, and um, we also make uh, by having like these categorizations of tactics or way of handling certain problems, of course it's going to be easier to make the, the architecture. You're going to have like this tool chest or this toolkit where you can reuse kind of solutions. Um, you can use the same tactics for solving several different problems. Uh, you can use your, your reusable, reusable modules for your architecture and stuff like that. And of course, the considerations like how much time will it take to implement a certain feature? Um, you know, cost involved, uh, technologies involved, and so on. And then, after like after you've deployed tactics, like when you start making the code or when you start designing your architecture, there are a number of other considerations to make, like questions to ask yourself, like allocation of responsibilities. I'm gonna. Pick up my cheat sheet here. So, um, so allocation of responsibility. Um, who or what is responsible for solving certain functionality? So, if I'm going to have a logging module, right? Like I'm going to log a fault or log a problem that happened. That has to be implemented somewhere, right? It needs to be a utility class, maybe, that has a logging feature and. Of course, I don't want to paste the same code over and over again, right? So I would prefer to make it reusable so I can have the same logging feature. So I could do, uh, um, I can maybe even turn it on and not turn it off. Or I could do more uh, detailed logging if I detect a fault. If there's an exception, make a proper stack print or whatever. Uh, send it somewhere, maybe notify someone. Um, if I forgot something. Uh, another thing, part of that is, is uh, identifying the important responsibilities. Like, if we look at uh, if we lo look at, at these, oops, if we look at these steps, what are the important events that can take place? What can actually cause a fault in our software? What or, or what can uh, what what are the considerations in terms of usability or, or in terms of modifiability? Uh, what are the important uh, or critical elements or components for this? 
And that also needs to be, I mean, you need to make sure that you focus on that in the allocation of responsibilities. So this is actually about which module does what? How do you make it reusable? You can even call it, you can even uh, go so far as to say which developer does what? Like who's gonna do where, what and where? Um, next one, coordination model. Once you've identified the critical resources or the critical elements in your code or the critical components, you need to figure out how will they com communicate with each other? What, re what relationship does they have to something else? And what happens at runtime? Because in terms of availability, I think that's a very good case in this. If, um, this is a very good use case in here. Um, like if I know that my um, login feature is vulnerable, right? right? And I, but it has to work all the time. I, I need people to be able to log in, right? And that is a critical like resource that I need to be have available. Uh, and I know that something is happening with a network or there are too many connections or whatever. And I know, if I know the relationships between things at runtime, I can start taking steps to balance the load. I could offload certain things. I could limit certain non-essential uh, messages. Um, as with this green button thing, like if I'm gonna have launch the, the, the dialogue, I can start looking at non-critical resources and degrade those while keeping, maintain, making sure that this green button actually, you know, 100% all the time works by making sure that this has quality of service preference. Uh, but for that to work at all, I need to know these relationships at runtime, the coordination model. For data model, third one. It's about, of course, storage of data, storage of management of data. How do we actually uh, handle uh, storage, dele deletion, creation of data, access to data? Again, this green button is launching a dialogue. How do we make sure that this information that is populated in the dialogue is being generated? If that is going to go to a database somewhere, um, how, how can we make sure that this actually gets the data? Can we have some safeguards or, or checkups? Like if it doesn't actually get the database, can we do some retries or um, can we get the data from somewhere else? Can we do, you know, how do we handle data? It's fairly simple. Management of resources. Um, so in the re resources in this particular case is anything quantifiable that is limited in some way. It could be bandwidth, it could be data storage, it could be um, uh, access, a number of accesses per second or whatever, you know? Uh, so if we know that the load during certain times of day, like during lunchtime, everyone checks their email and uh, the system has a heavy load on it. How do we manage those resources? Are we giving preference to uh, paying customers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so basically managing our limited resources, the ones that are limited. Uh, fifth one, mapping amongst uh, architectural elements. So um, I'm gonna go to my cheat sheet here for a moment. Um, so that has to do with modules about components, um, where code is located how, again, a little bit how they are related to each other, but um, specifically, like if I have a thread on what processor am I uh, allocating that to, or uh, um, where, where do I actually store certain data? Um, where, you know, where do I deliver certain things? Um, how, how do I actually manage like the whole um, well, in the architecture, where do I locate things to make, to actually consider availability in this case? Um, do I have some form of, like, this processor will, you know, always work or, or, like, 
if I, I, if I also do backup and things like that, or, or a spare or something like that, how do I actually create the, the code to make those decisions at runtime where I allocate things? Binding time decisions. So do you all know polymorphism? Okay, you should if you've done any object-oriented programming, I think. So that's when you can uh, swap a class for another because they use the same interface. Uh, and you can do that at runtime. Now that is pretty common in, in uh, development where if you're gonna look, if you've, if you've seen the videos uh, on design patterns, um, and they should be about time that you look at those if you haven't already. Um, then there's two patterns, one abstract factory and one factory method. Uh, builder to some extent, I guess, um, can use um, polymorphism or, or late binding. It, it's basically when at compile time, you don't know which components are being used at runtime, right? So you might add sensors at runtime or you might add features at runtime that increase the functionality of your software or your product. In the case of availability, you need to, of course, make sure that those components that you add don't break the system, right? So, um, so anything that you add later on will have consequences on the quality of your product. So bind time decisions make a difference here as well in terms of architecture and safeguards and all those things. And then finally, choice of technologies. Um, what can you actually, like backup solutions, um, RAID storage, whatever. There are lots of, of technologies they can use that can help you. Monitoring technologies, uh, temperature gauges to help make sure that the temperature doesn't rise above a certain critical level. Lots of things that you can consider to, to uh, help your quality attributes. Okay, I'm gonna skip some slides because I've covered these already. There's too much text on these slides, so that's why. Find time. I kept them because if you want to download the slides later on, you'll have the full explanation there. Uh, we've done half an hour. Let's uh, take a five minute break and then we'll do availability. Yes, it's going to be slightly shorter next week today.
just waiting for everyone to return again. One person missing for the two. I think he's out smoking. So, continue talking if you want. Okay, it's been five minutes, so let's continue. So, availability then, going into details about this um, quality attribute. So, I'll just go through what available is, um, give you a general scenario about it, some of these tactics and this um, these questions or the considerations, I call it the design checklist um, for availability, and then uh, then we'll summarize the lecture. So basically, what it is, it's uptime, making sure your system is always available, always working, ready ready to carry out tasks, ready to recover from faults, uh, making sure that uh, you can you can create you can uh, produce the results that are expected at any time. Um, I think the old phone switches that Ericsson used, I think I've used this as an example before, but they had, like, they should be available at 99.9999% of the time, and the reboot should take 0. Point something something seconds. Um, so that is a definitely an availability requirement, right? making sure that it's working all the time, and if it has to reboot, it should be very, very quickly so that you can recover from any faults or anything like that very quickly. So, just a very short exercise for you to sit and discuss. Uh, imagine Google email, or Google Mail, um, and in particular, in particularly uh, the availability requirement here. Just sit and discuss for a few minutes with someone, like, what are the potential risks involved? And now we're not looking at security specifically, but, but availability here. Um, where do these risks come from? Where do the problems occur? Uh, what, would, uh, what should be done when a problem occurs? How do we measure whether, uh, whether we respond well to these um, problems? And uh, we, you don't need to discuss the tactics for now because we'll discuss that in a moment. So, uh, just other questions here. Stimulus source environment, response, metrics. So, a uh, few minutes.
Can I hear some potential risks then? Anyone have any suggestions? Power outage. Power outage, certainly. And, uh, well, where that risk comes from, there could be a certain number of, like, storms, uh, all sorts of things. Um, where does this affect the system? Well, everywhere, I guess. Like, depending on, well, actually, you might have systems separated between sites. So it might be a specific site. But you don't really know beforehand, right? So what, I, what do you actually do if there is a power outage? What's your response? You can have a generator. That is a certainly a, a good backup system for, for making sure it works. Uh, anything else you can think of? Co for Pardon? Co-hosting. Co-hosting, yeah. Uh, you can have data hosted somewhere else as well uh, for, for mail and stuff like that. Um, you could, and if, if you do that, maybe you were doing load balancing before and suddenly one, one entire site goes down, so lots of connections are going to be forwarded to one site. So the performance is going to go down slightly, right? Because there are more people sharing this one site. So if Facebook in the US goes down, then our Facebook here is going to have more connections, I assume. Uh, although they have lots of backups over there as well. But anyways, so the whole load balancing, the performance is being degraded. Um, and you might actually even notify the user that, uh, unfortunately, we're experiencing technical, di di technical difficulties right now. Please have a patience with the service being slightly slower. Just to avoid all these phone calls from people being angry, like, my mail is slow today, you know? So if you inform them, right? So information here is key as well, right? Um, and how do we measure whether we responded well to the power outage? Downtime, certainly. So when is the service back up? Anything else? I would say number of complaints, maybe. If there is a maximum number, like if you, you want to keep it low, right? Because that also affects the whole information and the messaging things and stuff like that. Uh, contacting to service personnel, how long it took to uh, get the generators back up. All those things like are things you can measure. And let's pick one more. If, if you have another... Um, Risk. Anyone? Apart from power outage? Is that the only risk? Malicious attacks? Uh, sure, let's go with that one. Um, it's kind of bordering to, to uh, security, but let's go with, border with malicious attacks in terms of availability then. Um, source? Well, someone with malicious intent. Um, environment? Probably somewhere authentication, data, um, uh, logins, uh, personal data, I'm guessing, or, or even uh, uh, available. Uh, like, um, pardon? Service shutdown, yeah. So those kind of systems would be primarily targeted for such a thing, right? Um, and how do we respond? to uh, malicious attacks? With force, With force absolutely. Um, any other way? Well, force kind of covers a lot of things, I suppose. Um, well, you, I mean, there are ways to, um, again, degraded performance. You could have um, detectors that would detect malicious attacks coming in and you have uh, a number of like tries and then you shut people off, you close them off or, or you may even like direct them to a, a, a different part of the system. If you're, if you're suspecting a malicious attack, you send them to another part of the system. They may, if, if it's not actually a malicious attack, they may actually still access the data but from a slower or something else server, right? Um, of course, you will probably notify the technicians to make sure that they, you know, or someone, a malicious attack underway, you know. Um, you're probably going to respond with logging the interactions, like any transactions, any data coming in, any operations being run. You may even log changes to data so you can restore the data afterwards. 
So you can do undo, undo operations. And now we're actually going into the security, but it doesn't really matter. Um, for, the, for, for this exercise, wait, well, let's, let's go with it. Um, and how do we measure whether we responded well to malicious attacks? Or, or, well, one of course metrics would be preventing a number of malicious attacks or, or actually, you know, how, how many per month do you actually get through or how many are stopped? That would be one metric, I suppose. But it kind of assumes that people will start continuing to do malicious attacks. Any other way that you can measure? Time to find the breach. Time to find the yeah, absolutely, good, good one. Um, and time to address the breach as well um, before countermeasures um, are, are being put in. Let, let's uh, let's stop there. But at least I think you got the the whole way of thinking, right? And why do why did I have this exercise? Well, it affects. It, it's a way of finding these critical resources. When I start looking at my architecture, it's a way of okay for malicious attacks, even though that it's kind of borderline security or availability. But, but what are the components? We already said that it's going to be uh, service service operation uh, modules. It's going to be uh, personal data. It's going to be logins and authentication stuff, right? So those will be the vulnerable components primarily. How do I secure those? How do I make sure that uh, people that I suspect of malicious attacks are directed somewhere else, or how do I notify someone to to come in and, and address this problem? Uh, how do I log things? How do I make sure that I can undo any damage that's been done? All that affects the architecture and the components I put in the architecture. And you can imagine that if you have a rather large software, it's going to have lots and lots of these components. <laughs> And that's why creating large softwares is really difficult, <laughs> because the, mo the moment you go into details about addressing one specific problem, you realize there are lots and lots of things that I need to think about. Of course, there are ways to, that help you, like OAuth 2 as authentication. It's like a framework that you can reuse that helps you with you know, authentication, uh, but you still need to make sure that your own data is safe, of course. But yeah, those are toolkits or, or components that you can reuse. Okay, let's continue. Uh, so this is just, uh, it's actually from the book, um, some uh, examples they, they thought of. Um, so source, and this is like a general thing, internal, external, uh, people, hardware, software, physical infrastructure, uh, physical environment, so there's where things can happen. It's very general. Uh, things that can go wrong, the stimulus, um, mission crash, incorrect timing, incorrect response. The environments in this case, they said normal operations, in normal operation, a number of things can happen. At startup, shutdown, repair mode, degraded operation, overload operation. So these are the different uh, working environments that this, the product can be in. Um, so their definition in this particular case is kind of in terms of software uh, states, I suppose. Uh, but all the things that you said all so far already, I think were very, very good choices as well. Um, responses, log the fault, notify appropriate entities. Um, so you, that's for detection, for recovering, well, disable the source uh, that may be causing the fault, be temporarily unavailable, fix or mask the fail failure, uh, operate in degraded mode. Uh, response measure, uh, uh, time or time interval, uh, that the system has to be unavailable, availability percentage, time to detect fault, time to repair the fault, um, time interval, that the system can be in degraded mode, proportion, something or rate of certain class of faults that can the system prevents or handles without failing. So basically these were things we covered already. I think you said most of them, at least you know, picked some here and there. Anyways. So very good. Uh, I'm going to let you do another very short exercise. Hopefully these, uh, I did an animation of this before. And hopefully, oops, you're not supposed to see that there. Hopefully you didn't see too much. Okay, so um, I would like you to first start discussing
tactics, things you can do to detect faults. Let's just take uh, one minute, come up with one or two per like discussion team and then we'll have some examples of this. Okay, any ideas on how you'd detect faults? Logging, uh, certainly. Um, I would, yes, it, it's absolutely true. I, it, it's categorized, ca categorized as something else here on the, the screen, um, I believe. But that's, logging is certainly a thing where if you monitor the logs. And uh, anything else? If you're in between the, the components? Absolutely. And you expect a response, and if nothing happens, then um, yeah, it's probably dead. Anything else? Okay, so uh, you could I can ping first one. Um, second one monitor is kind of what the logging uh, covers. I think you monitor the logs and see if there's some unexpected behavior. Um, uh, you monitor the state of certain parts of the system, um, making sure that they are uh, up and running. You can detect certain faults, etc. Heartbeat. Uh, periodically, you send out like uh, the component itself sends out, "I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive," or the TCP connection is up and running, it's up and running. You know, um, just to, to notify the observers that I'm still working. Uh, as I should, or in the right way. You can use timestamps, and this is particularly, like, if you expect messages to arrive in a certain order, and you are afraid of man-in-the-middle attacks or, or unexpected delays or, or things like that, right? Uh, or there might be a heavy load on the network connection, which causes messages to arrive in the wrong order, etc., and so on. Uh, that could cause faults. So you could look at timestamps to make sure that they arrive as they should and, and um, you know, right order and things like that. Uh, as a, to detect that there might be a problem of heavy load on the chat in the network or whatever. Uh, sanity checking is basically, does this make sense? Like, um, should I really get the knowledge? Should I really get false here, or should I really get null pointer exception here? Like, it makes no sense, it should never happen, right? Um, so that's kind of like, does it make sense? But you can also do it like with, um, it, it's kind of related to this voting as well. If you have several uh, um, entities running in parallel, or, or if you have backups running in parallel, then here you can have voting, like, I believe the state is false, and then another one says, I believe the state is false, and the third one says, I believe the state is true. Then the voting says it's false because two versus one, right? Um, so you can, if, if you have multiple entities running the same thing, you can have some voting for that. Uh, condition monitoring. Um, again, about uh, kind of does it make sense? You can monitor the condition of a component, you can monitor conditions in uh, in the software itself. Um, and then exception detection, null pointer exceptions, et cetera, et cetera. Like 
you can detect problems in your code and you can we'll, we're going to see exception detection is going to be detection prevention detection oh, along the way here but um, yeah and then self test in these if you know this if you know what the expected behavior is you can start making like sending some form of input and expecting certain outputs and you can have a, a piece of code that actually does that automatically from time to time to make sure everything is still working as it should does this make sense okay good let's uh let's have another short discussion on recover from faults and uh, let's do both of these subcategories at once Okay, sounds like you've had your discussion. So can I get some suggestion? How can you recover from faults? Restore backups, absolutely. Uh, so this restore backups is kind of going, it's going to arrive here as three different options, I suppose, um, or, or ways of dealing with restoring backups. Anything else? A restart, I would call that, yes. Absolutely, restart the service. Anything else? Pardon? Ah, oh, remove corrupted files. Yeah, absolutely. Um, remove, you know, whatever faulty component. Uh, yeah, restore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was trying to categorize it as, as one of these terms, but yes, you're right. Okay, so here are a number, so these would probably be kind of, this is what you were saying, kind of like, uh, um, yeah, okay. Uh, these first ones will be restoring from backup, kind of. Uh, redundancy is, is related to it. If you have active redundancy, it's basically when you have another system running in parallel receiving the same messages, calculating the same things, and giving the same responses. So if one breaks down, there's basically going to be a spare. So load balancing would be kind of be like an active spare, right, that we talked about before. Uh, positive redundancy would be uh, one active uh, entity running everything. The passive one receives status updates every now and then. So it will be semi-caught up, right? So every now and then, the main, the running one will be sending, okay, I've, this is what I've done the last hour, right? So the most you'll lose is some progress and they will start up from there. The spare is basically, you have a spare system, but it's not running. So if the first one breaks, you'll start that one up and there'll be some delay before it's caught up and running, right? Exception handling. Uh, basically, if you detected the exception, what do you actually do that? Do you do with that? Do you actually close the system or do you deal with it? Do you, uh, I don't know, do you log it and then go on and then mask it? So this is kind of like 
uh, masking the problem itself, but just continue running. Rollback, rollback to a previously working system. Software upgrade, well, patch the problem, of course, and then make sure it runs in the future. Retry, if something fails the first time, try, try again. <laughs> um, ignore faulty behavior. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I usually do when, I, when I'm cheating. It's like, yeah, uh, this didn't work out, but just, just continue and see what happens. <laughs> it's probably not the best way of doing things, but it's, it usually works in research because nobody really, like, oh, I shouldn't say that. Okay, ignore me. Um, uh, degradation, uh, so that we've talked about this a few times already, but basically degrade the system to make sure that you can still serve customers, but with what limited performance you still have based on what's still working. Uh, reconfiguration, I think I have to actually go to my cheat sheet here. Um, oh yeah, uh, if one component or one um, artifact breaks down, you can reassign uh, the runtime behavior to some other components. Like if one CPU goes down, you can reassign it, or if one entity goes down, you can reassign it. And it's kind of also, again, like load balancing. Uh, if this goes down, let's you know, shift it. And again, implementing that, how do you actually implement that in, in architecture? Um, and I am, I'm sure you could Google some examples on, on if you look at these tactics like reconfiguration, um, availability, and then source code, and you'll probably find some examples of how to do that. Um, okay, uh, shadow. Again, I think I have to go to my um, cheat sheet. Okay, so basically when you are starting things up, so when, when you've had a, a faulty component uh, and you want to reintroduce it, as they, you fixed it, you re rebooted it, right? And then you want to reintroduce it, you, you let it shadow the other spare or the other existing system for a while to make sure that you, you validate that it actually works again. So it st still doesn't have this faulty behavior. So you let it follow around for a while and you have, basically for a while you have an active redundancy until you let the the previously broken one take over again. State resynchronization. Um, basically, again, when you're trying to set the system back up, you, you resynchronize the states, you make sure that they're both at the same, same states and, and you can continue. Uh, so you're sending uh, information between active and standby components back and forth. Escalate and restart, basically uh, you can restart, instead of restarting the entire system, you can restart one component at a time to kind of do some reconfiguration and load balancing while other components are still running. So you re restart parts of the system gradually and, and then eventually you're going to have restarted the entire system, right? Now we're talking about a pretty large system with lots of uh, components and entities involved. And then non-stop forwarding uh, is basically, well, a component breaks, well, let's just forward the information so we don't lose anything. Let's store it somewhere and let's process it back later when the system is back up. Uh, so those were how you can recover from faults. Let's have a very short one on preventing faults as well. One or two minutes.
Okay, can I have some uh, suggestions? How do you prevent things faults from happening? Pardon? Testing. testing, yeah, absolutely. I don't think it's listed here, but it should be. Proper testing will uh, prevent faults. Anything else? I think we already mentioned one of them, like remove the faulty component. Um, well, if, if if before, like if you can detect, if you can monitor a component, you're realizing that this is going bad, like uh, a hard drive is having uh, faulty writes and stuff like that. It's still working, kind of, but you you can remove it before it becomes a problem. So you can remove the faulty behavior before it escalates, right? Um, anything else? Early detection. Yeah, so prediction of faults, or, or you can even prepare, like related to early detection, I don't think it's exactly this, but it's very related. Like if you know that there's gonna be, during lunchtime, we're gonna have lots and lots of people coming in to check our email, right? You could prepare for that, you could make sure that there's staff on hand to, to handle any problems, or you can uh, add more resources at that time, like, we'll subscribe to the Amazon service to handle some of our calculations during the heavy load time, right? Or whatever. Um, so yeah, early, if you can predict or early, detect, if you can detect early, you can take steps to prevent it. Yes, absolutely. Okay, let's show them. So removal from service, we covered that one. Uh, transactions, I'm gonna go back to my uh, sheet sheet again. Um, so basically, um, when it comes to, to state updates and, and so on, uh, you can, you, well, if you're going to have, if you have asynchronous behavior, uh, and, um, fault might actually come from, like if there's heavy load on the traffic and fault might come from asynchronous messages coming in the wrong order, et cetera, et cetera. You could bundle them up and send them as like a package or something like that. Um, so that is one way for, for that particular use case, I suppose. Uh, predictive model, early detection. That's what you said. So perfect. Um, exception prevention. Well, again, it's, it's exception detection and we had exception handling and exception prevention. Yeah, make sure it actually, you don't actually get an exception by uh, covering all your cases, make sure you don't have division by zero. I mean, make sure that you actually prevent that it, that problem ever happens. Now, I've uh, being a programmer, it's so easy to to like this would probably never happen. But if you could like spend five ten minutes to actually make sure it will never happen, if availability is one of your main requirements, then that's what you should do, right? Um, and increase competency sets. So that is related to exception prevention. Like in the process industry, if something breaks, you add a test case for that, right? Like to make sure it, it doesn't happen again. You make a security, you take the safety guards to make sure it never happens again. Same with software. If you have an exception at some point, okay, how can we make sure that we prevent that exception in the future? You add the competence of the software to handle such problems in the future. Uh, to deal with those things. Okay, so those are uh, some of the tactics that you can have to deal with availability. Any questions about this? I hope this way of doing like one branch at a time and discussing it slightly was interesting and I'm trying to explain how it fits together as well. Good. I think that was one of the, oh, that was one of the changes I've tried to make to make this a little bit more interesting and, and so on from last year. And now we can skip lots of slides as well. Again, you can refer back to these later on if you um, want to um, read the slides and learn from them. Okay. Now the design decisions. Okay, so here's another change I did from last year. Last year I, I let you have the group discussions and lots of papers and, and there were too much information. So I've, I've uh, cut this down and 
just pick the most important things. So what do we consider for each of these um, you know, uh, attributes or, or, or these parts, right? Um, and how does that affect the architecture? So let's go to the first one, allocation of responsibilities. We already covered like the whole source and the stimuli and, and the tactics, right? So what code or what part is, handled, is handling the detecting and handling of faults? How does that affect my architecture decisions? How does that affect the software design decisions that I make? Uh, and who is going to implement that? Uh, the automated fixes of faults. If I have some form of recovery service, what does that actually looks like? Look like the logging features. Is there a reusable utility component that can do that for me, uh, that I can just add somewhere? How do I make it reusable for all the different submodules? How do I communicate this with other develop de development teams? Uh, notifications, like if something happens, who is going to be notified? How do I make this uh, modifiable so that uh, it's easy to add new people uh, to the notification list? How does this happen quickly? How do I make sure that they get the information and, and start dealing with a um, problem right away? Can I, what information do I actually provide in the notifications so the support personnel can get up and running and fix the problem quickly? Can I uh, give them a link to a, a support page where they can just fix it like or a restart page where they can manually restart certain services how can i make this as quick as possible uh, disconnecting the faulty source again you need to detect that there is a faulty source you need to do monitoring where does monitoring happen uh, how do i how do i dis disconnect it now and how do i actually cover from this like how, how do i cover that behavior that was supposed to be done here uh, can I do load balancing somehow? Can I distribute the behavior somehow? Can I do a reconfiguration somehow? Uh, where does that happen and how do the code look like? Degraded mode operation. Okay, if, if I'm gonna, if I know that I have a problem with my, my product and I need to degrade operation, like what information do I provide? In the, in the case of email, as I said before, we can say to the customer, we are currently experiencing technical difficulty. Um, you will have slower response times, etc. So that is kind of also related to notification, right? Notifying people that this is happening, but at the same time, also being able to operate the service with the most essential features. And again here, um, what are the most critical features? What are the most important things to be able to continue to do? What can I actually remove from the service to, to simplify or to, to ease the load on the server or systems? It, to, to provide the most important, the most critical features, even though I have some faulty behavior somewhere. Uh, some splash screen when unavailable, that's related to notification. Okay, so basically these pages here are, are things that you can ask yourself when you're designing. If, if, if availability is the most important thing in your software, you need to go into depth and find, you need to ask yourself these questions to realize how you should actually implement your software. Does that make sense? Good. Uh, coordination model. Again, it identified the critical components and the dependencies. Uh, we, we took kind of a security case before, like malicious attacks. We said uh, personal data, uh, service operation, et cetera, et cetera. So those were critical components, right? For availability. Uh, what is the most critical data? What, what should I absolutely have access to? Okay, access to. And we need to figure out uh, how to make the fl structure flexible to make, to make sure that I can always provide that critical resource. If email is the most critical thing, how can I always make sure that email, that you can read your text? Maybe I can skip the graphical interface. Maybe I could go down to some form of uh, what's a good uh, text-based mail client? You, know, you could go back to the basic performance as long as you can provide just the text, which is the most important part in this case, maybe. Uh, and then you need to be able to reconfigure your structure to provide that essential behavior. Uh, so make a flexible structure for monitoring faults of existing new components, for logging faults, 
uh, for replacing faulty components at runtime and for running in degraded performance. So this is not easy, right? How do you make such a flexible system? But those are questions you need to ask yourself if availability is the most important thing. And that is why people with really good experience in software architecture design are very valuable because they probably encountered these, or if, at least if they work at a company where availability is important. They've encountered this problem before. They have a set of solutions. They, they, they know what's, how to design such modules, and they might reuse modules from different projects before, like that's, we're going to have this and this and this and that. Data model, what data is critical? Uh, how are we taking sufficient step of backup? Do we have enough RAID drives? Do we have uh, off-site off storage somewhere? Uh, can we do, uh, do we have good bandwidth to access that data? Um, can we access it during downgraded performance? What are the bottlenecks and access issues in terms of connections to this data, et cetera, at, at one point? Uh, mapping amongst architectural elements. Um, well, is the architecture flexible enough to support the remapping, the reconfiguration? Um, and in this case, we look at processes as storage of data, communication channels. <coughs> How do we recover at runtime? Do we have redundancies in terms of uh, entities that can, can pick up, like an active spare or, or something like that? Resource management. To know what can actually be degraded, like what resources, if that fails, can I delegate the information to the processing to some, somewhere else? Or uh, uh, is it okay that if that degrades because it, it's not critical to the functionality? Um, know which resources are critical, when are they most critical? Uh, at time of day, we said everyone checks their email at lunchtime, okay? How many expected connections do I have? What are the bottlenecks? What do I do if I get too many connections, uh, too much bandwidth requirements, or, or if, if storage is the thing? Okay, if I go over storage, like, or if I'm reaching the end of storage, what do I do with that then? Uh, downtime, acceptable downtime, how long do I accept, uh, should, how, what's the maximum time of, of getting back up, et cetera? So these are my limited resources, the things that actually might run out in a sense. How do I manage that and how do, how do I prevent them from running out? How do I prevent bandwidth from running out? How do I prevent storage from running out, et cetera? And you can store operations, et cetera, so you can do them again once you get the system back up and running, for instance, so you don't lose anything. Finding time uh, in, the, in the availability case, I already mentioned this slightly. So if I have uh, external components, hardware or modules or things that I add at runtime, flexible systems, I need to make sure that they don't break my existing system. And I also need to ask the questions, what are the availability considerations of these external components? If I'm not the creator of these, if there's a third party component that I can add into the system, can I have somehow like uh, segment that into a more secure section or that, that won't break the rest of the system? or can I, and can I somehow enforce that external components of third-party systems actually consider availability as well? Is there some metric that they can run, some tests they can run to make sure that they actually uh, follow the standards I set? Uh, how do I handle fault detection on external components that are being added at runtime? time? And then choice of technology, so we have monitoring technologies, we have uh, backup technologies, load balancing technologies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there are lots of technologies, so even frameworks could, in this case could be considered technologies where I can use existing frameworks that I know work, that I know have been tested and I know the features and what they can do. And of course, the availability characteristics of technologies themselves is important here. So these were the choices, or, or these were the considerations, or some of them anyways. I find that this kind of um, list is quite helpful. Uh, when I read it the first time, and I, I read this long specification, and then before I boiled it down to these more essential ones, I realized that what I myself had been thinking, or the things that, the questions or the decisions I would have made, 
would not have created a complete system. I would have forgotten things. Uh, like I would have forgotten to consider even something as simple as monitoring or logging. Like I would have added it for sure later on, but during, like when developing, and I would have realized, oh, I need some logging, I need some monitoring, right? I would have realized that while programming, quite likely, but I would have likely missed it during the design phase because that for me was not the essential component. Like the, the functionality itself, that's the one I need to produce first. That's for me, as like uh, in that case, the newbie designer, I, I, I have to call myself that, I suppose, because I haven't worked in the industry for 20 years in this particular area. So I would have missed that, but I added, would have added it later on. But the design, the architecture would not have been as good if I added it later on. If I design the software from start with a proper monitoring component, the proper logging component, I can make sure it's reusable. I can co communicate this design. We don't have uh, architecture degradation or design degradation, as we talked about, or design rot, as we talked about in the previous lecture, where suddenly the, the code that we have does not match the specification. Because if, the more I can consider at the design phase, the fewer changes need to be made, and, and the better we can make sure that the communication, the dependencies, the coupling, the cohesion, and all those things work together, right? Because it's we've put it in together from the start. And now, of course, of course, you can have iterative development. If you know beforehand we're going to need a logging component, we're going to need a, um, a monitoring component, and I know where to put them later on, it's fine. You can create the software in the term of modules, and such, et cetera. Uh, and you can create it in phases, in iterations. That's not a problem. But you need to be able to consider these. And I think these questions, like uh, uh, for these you know, allocation of responsibilities and stuff like that, it's quite a helpful starting list to go through, I think. OK. Sum up, and soon you'll have lunch, so I guess. Um, yeah, so availability refers to uptime, basically, uh, to make sure that you can prevent fault and then make sure that the system is always running. Uh, so we need to recognize the fault. We need to uh, respond to the fault and make sure the critical components are still up and running. Oop. And uh, we've discussed tactics and ways to deal with this, um, that we can have detect to detect faults, to recover from faults, and to prevent faults. Um, and we've, detect we've talked about a few of these steps that you can go through. So I would like to end like this, uh, like this, unless you have questions, any questions? Okay. So next time we'll go through, I think, two or three more uh, quality attributes. Perfect. Oh, um, before you go, uh, did you think this setup of the lecture was, was decent? Good.
Your meeting has ended.